In 1970, 30%, 37% of the GDP in Malaysia is, was actually contributed from the agricultural uh, sector, right? But in 2010, this has dropped to 7%, right? So that is the state and situation of the agricultural, uh, agricultural industry in Malaysia right now. And, uh, you know, whenever we think about agriculture, we don't really think about progressiveness or young people being involved in the industry. So I think one of the main reasons that we're going to have this discussion today is also to actually promote the industry, to say that, hey, this is an industry that is worthwhile uh, participating in and taking part in, right? Okay, so that is what uh, we would like to do today. So to start off things, uh, maybe I would like to maybe pose a question to Mr. H.S. Wong. Uh, Mr. H.S. Wong, we know you as somebody who was from the corporate industry, from the corporate sector, right? Uh, and, and you turned your life around 360 degrees. Something sparked it. There must have been a tipping point to make you leave the corporate sector and actually join the agricultural industry. One of the things that, that I have uh, always had a passion and a calling for is, is things like... Uh, organic farming. You know, I come from a, a family history of farmers, so I suppose it comes naturally. Roy also comes from a family uh, of farmers. So we were farmers once, and then we become uh, great guys, corporate, you know, flying here, flying there, meeting with prime ministers all over the world. And at the end of the day, we decided to come back to farming. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I went into, uh, I was into a lot of uh, organic stuff, alternative stuff, uh, because of uh, you know, various issues with friends and colleagues. Health issues. Now, now we know that in 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 your industry, uh, like what you do, for example, you 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 raise chickens, organic chickens, and things like this. Now, one of the key elements, I guess, in your business is that you manage to keep a very good, what well, we call it, chicken welfare, right? Very low mortality rate. Uh, can you maybe explain a little bit about uh, the process of how you raise your chickens? The learning curve was there. Don't 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 think that this thing happened overnight. You know, there was a, a long learning curve. Uh, there was a lot of money lost. Uh, I had to sell some houses, you know, just to keep, keep the thing moving because of the learning curve. Because I believe at the end of the day, you know, uh, I can make it. So I was willing to take that kind of a risk and continue. One of the things that, that uh, I found in the long learning curve is that stress not only affects us human beings, but it also affects the chickens. And it also affects the goats and the cows. And the root cause of most of the health issues uh, with animals actually stress. You know, you put them all together in a tight environment, they have a lot of stress. Uh, you, you, you handle them roughly, they have a lot of stress. And because of the stress, pathogens come in and diseases come in. Same with us, you know. Uh, but over the years, learning about stress, learning about certain plants in the environment. You, there, are, there are a lot of herbs and natural plants in the environment in Malaysia uh, where you can, uh, which actually uh, boost the immune system of the animals. I, I haven't tried it on human beings, but you know, it helps the animals. And as a result of which today, our mortality rate is something uh, I would say is uh, uh, at, at the top of the industry, which uh, that we raise chickens from zero day, zero first day until 90 days, 100 days. The mortality is only 2%, you know? And these chickens are out in, the, out in the rain and sun, you know? Uh, they don't come back into a house at, uh, at night. Uh, the way we farm is that you get out into the sun and you stay outside there, you know? And we, we, and, and, uh, but of course, we control the environment. We make sure they have sufficient space. Uh, we are giving them 50 square feet uh, per chicken. In a factory farming environment, you, are, you, are, you, you give them 0.75 feet per chicken. So you can see a big difference there the stress factor. Okay. And there is, uh, I'm assuming there is, there is a direct relationship between uh, the welfare of the chicken, how healthy the chicken is, with how healthy the consumers are when they, when, when they consume the chicken, right? Yeah, uh, we have done tests. Uh, I think one of the most important issues is, uh, for example, the lipids content mm. of animals. The lipids content of animals uh, Effects. I mean, all of you know about omega-6 and omega-3 and how omega-3 is good for you. But are you aware that, for example, corn is uh, the omega-6, omega-3 ratio is uh, 40 to 1, and therefore 40 to 1 is bad for you, if you know about omega-6 and, and what it does to you. 
Now, most of our Malaysian chickens are being fed corn from morning until night, night until morning, 24 hours. And what happened to all the omega-6? End up in the chicken. And what happened to the, the omega-6? When you eat the chicken, it ends up in you. you know? So when the chickens are out in the field and, and we feed them natural feed, and uh, one of the things that we feed them is actually uh, pisang, pisang uh, nipah. Omega-6, omega-3 is one to one. Okay? So you can see the big difference there. Corn gives energy. Pisan nipa gives energy. Corn gives you 40 to 1. Pisan nipa is 1 to 1. So, uh, and, and this affects you because, you have, because in, in Malaysia, uh, chicken is the main protein, I think, of most people. And you tend to think that this is a white meat that I can eat it every day, you know. And that is the problem. It accumulates in you. Mm. So it's actually quite high standards that you're, you're actually looking at when, when, when you're raising chickens and making sure that they are healthy enough to be consumed uh, by the consumers. And on that note, uh, speaking about high quality standards of procedures, I would like to move on to uh, Mr. Loy, right, uh, from the Hosteen Milk Company. Now, in the industry, we know that the Hosteen Milk uh, Company is actually among the top uh, when it comes to ensuring high quality dairy products that go into the market in Malaysia, the domestic market. Uh, maybe you can you know, shed some light into the procedures, that, you know, how you operate your business. I think in my context is that uh, because we are integrated, we actually uh, process, uh, uh, not only process our milk, we actually started from our own farming as well. So that is the uh, 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 industry that we're in. We, we, are, we are farmers, we are also a processor. At the same time, we also market our produce directly to the supermarkets. Yeah. So, so it's, it's like more grass, like a one-stop center, yeah, right? From grass to, to glass, you know, that is basically what we're actually striving at. In terms of uh, agriculture, I think it's, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of challenges. It's not, it's not something like uh, the whole bay full of roses and things like that. Uh, when we started, we actually started from a very small farm. Actually, we started from a small animal, goats. Uh, which is a Ruminant as well. Then from there, uh, we learn the curve, we move on to the next step that, you know, we handle a bigger animal, which is, which is the dairy cow. Uh, then from there on, you know, uh, we have to uh, move on uh, to our learning. And then along the way, there's a lot of things that actually that uh, we realize that uh, we actually don't know. In particular, when you want to operate a, a big, I will not say big, a, a commercial dairy farm. Historically, in, in, in Malaysia, all these dairy farmers are actually smallholders. Yeah? I think probably almost 95% of the milk produced in Malaysia arrive from the, uh, smallholders. So when we go in, on the basis that you know, when you have a uh, few hundred cows, vis-a-vis -vis those farmers that manage uh, 30 cows, 50 cows and things like that, it is very, very difficult to get the knowledge from the industry to manage a farm like that. I like poultry industry, for example, they're very well established. You have a lot of experts, you know, the vets and what's not. So, so when we go in there, I think the first couple of years is really, really yeah, very... Yeah. The, the factory farm is well established, but uh, free range, grass-fed chickens, nobody knew about it. Yeah. 13 years ago, I mean, the, it was a long learning curve. Take yeah. it from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and can I just make a comment on the, what Mr. Lloyd said? Please. I think it, the thing that, uh, again, uh, the thing that Mr. Lloyd, uh, when he said it, what struck me was that he went into milk business and not meat business, okay? Goats, you know, goats one year can only give you one and a half kids, you know? so that, uh, in terms of cash flow, it is very bad. And then this, is, this is the thing, because we are talking about agriculture as a business, and I think the first thing you have to be aware of, the, all the young people out there, you have to be aware of is that you have to be good in your numbers. You know, if you think that a farmer don't know how to count, you are, you are, you are, you are going to fail. You have to go online and, uh, and learn basic bookkeeping, for example. You have to learn how to read your financial statements. You, know, you, don't, you, you, don't, you don't just go and attend a three weeks, four weeks uh, course in permaculture and say, I want to be a farmer. You are going to fail. I just want to mention that because milk is cash flow. Why did I, when, uh, I, I started off with fruits and vegetables and why did I go into chickens? Cash flow. You know, part of the reason anyway, not the, but it is because of cash flow. I know you're a one-stop center and you produce everything from end to end, right? Uh, but what are the parties? I mean, do you, do you also uh, look at contracting farmers and, you know, to help you with your... You know? I think Malaysia in the past, uh, 
uh, don't know, I think two decades or so, I, till today, I think uh, our milk freshness sufficient, self-sufficiency is barely even 5%, you know. So I think uh, what, what is very encouraged is that uh, I think probably our timing was also quite right when we got into this business, whereby the, uh, under the ETP program, the government comes up with the NKEA projects whereby actually identify certain sectors that is, is, is strategic to the nation as well as important. And to them, actually come up with a program whereby, you know, uh, we have this uh, 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 EPP 13 program whereby the governments are actually facilitating uh, the grants, you know, to the anchor company whereby this is led by private sector to actually uh, educate the farmers. Uh, in our case is that we were actually appointed by getting 35 farmers into our, our, our umbrella, so to speak. And there, actually, uh, the government's not only given them the cows, for example, uh, I mean, besides improving the quantity uh, of the milk, you also want to improve the quality because all the processing plant paying the milk based on the quality that they receive. So to that, we don't, we not only give them, say, for example, they give you extra five cows or 10 cows and things like that. We also give you a milking uh, facilities instead of using hand. And, uh, and then to preserve the milk is very, very important because milk, it's, uh, it's spoiled within uh, half a day or so if you don't chill it down. So we actually give them chiller tank, for example, you know, so quickly chill down the milk and then you preserve the quality of the milk as a return. In return, when processing plant like us, when we receive the milk, we will pay them a great A milk. So we are working towards achieving most of our contract farmers uh, a high quality milk. And uh, what happened is that under this program, in the past, how the industry works is that you know, all the small contract farmers actually send the milk to the milk collection center. They do not have the privilege or the opportunity to work directly with the processing uh, company. So under the NKEA program, uh, we as a processor, we actually nurture these farmers directly and they actually have accounts with us, meaning that there's no intermediary in between, right? So we actually ended up able to pay them, let's say historically, they used to get about 150, 160 a liter. Today we are paying them almost close to 250. So there's a dollar more, you know. With that, let's say a farmer that has a milk of 100 liters a day, you get extra $3,000 income a month. That is a lot of money to a small holders. You can send the kids to the college with that amount of money. So I'm encouraged in the sense that because of this NKU program, uh, the way that we, we go about, and uh, we are able to come up with a kind of pricing that whereby the consumers are able to accept that pricing for the fresh milk that they pay mm. instead of reconstituted milk that on the shelf. So I think there's a lot of people don't know what they drink on the shelf is actually not fresh milk, it's from milk powder. And uh, when, when, when we are able to pay them fairly, so you have to make sure that there's something left on the table for the farmers that becomes sustainable. If they can't make money, Nobody want to go in, you know, at some point of time. So as I say, you can go on for another two decades and we are going nowhere because, because there's no money in dairy industry, for example. Hmm. So in that sense, you're actually encouraging the industry, trying to develop the industry. Uh, Haji Ibrahim, uh, being, being the sole representative from the government, <laughs> uh, what is the government's from? Is there a policy in encouraging this growth? Okay, policy overall, of course, we want to increase production. That's not only food safety, but food security we are talking about. But uh, when we talk about to achieve a um, progressive nation, high-income nation by 2020, then we have to rethink our strategy. That's why NKA comes in. You know? uh, through NKA, we enhance existing players. Uh, we are not uh, identifying you be a farmer, you uh, produce milk for the nation. But uh, we try to enhance existing players. We bring up to another stage so that they can be, if not a global player, they can be a player in the nation. But at the same time, we cannot forget, as far as the government is concerned, we cannot forget our commitment to the people also, to the farmers, to the small farmers. That's why under his program, EPP 13, we give him all the support, but at the same time, we support the small dairy farmers to be in synergy farming with him, not contract farming, synergy farming with him. So they're untung-tung, both win-win situation. They follow the SOP set by the company, I mean the farmers, follow SOP set the company, and guaranteed market by the company with a certain fair uh, pricing. Untung-tung lah. So, 
as it is, I like Derry, uh, they have 35 farmers with him now. But because of very good surprising they offered to the farmers, not only the synergy farmer selling milk to him, but also other farmers surrounding in the area. They got the milk from other farmers also. So if you ask him, do you think milk dairy can have another player here in Malaysia? Besides a lot dairy? Obviously, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So you're not going to monopolize yeah. everything? Yeah. No, 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 I don't think so. Yeah. So there's potential for growth. I think food business to me, I think is a very, uh, a very resilient model. Day in, day out, you know, people will have to consume. So I think that actually one of the things that actually prompted to me to look at agriculture as a business in a sense that I think uh, it's very challenging. I think that is something that all of us have to bear in mind. Agriculture is never easy. Yeah? It is very challenging and uh, you have to be very passionate about what you want to do and uh, you have to put in a lot of efforts and times into it you know, to actually uh, to see it through. I think the good thing is that it's going to be a very evergreen business. You are, you are there to sustain. I think that is something that you, know, you think back is worthwhile to spend all the time and effort. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to apologize, uh, Shana, sir. You've been feeling a bit neglected. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Wong, Mr. Louis, they're all in the farming and food industry. Uh, you're in a little bit different industry. You are, the, uh, you are more in the pharmaceutical uh, uh, field, and uh, it's health and uh, natural medicines that you are into. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, what you do. And I also understand that you are more into the international market rather than domestic. Yes, we are. I'm actually a pharmacist by profession. So I get asked very often, what on earth are you doing in this business? Um, and yes, I agree with the, the other panelists. You start off your career by wanting to go into um, multinationals and things like that. And then suddenly, suddenly you discover you're sick of the entire process. You're sick of the uh, five-star hotels, the business class and things like this. And then you say, I want to do something more meaningful. So you come back to us and you start a business. So myself and my partner, my partner is actually my first boss. We both got fed up together, I think. And then um, we started this and we went into natural products. Now this was quite by accident because if you go into pharmaceuticals, the barrier to entry is really, really high. It's like seven years, five to seven years. And the natural products offered us a low regulatory barrier to entry. So we went for this and we never thought that um, oops, we are going into an agricultural business. As we, as we moved along, we discovered that there is a value chain and I wouldn't call it an agriculture as in a farmer, but think of it as a sustainable business. And then you move down the line. Um, we, we were taking um, medicinal plants, medicinal herbs. Our focus was on uh, Sharia compliance. So this led us to another avenue, which was Islamic medicine. And when we saw this Islamic medicine, you actually see a lot of these things in, um, in normal uh, big brands. I give you an example. There are lots of, or well, maybe not so many ladies in the, in, the, in the audience. Estee Lauder has a range with a pomegranate extract. The pomegranate is actually described in the Quran as a fruit of the heaven. So if you go down the science of these things, you find that it leads to... Uh, uh, the Quran would lead you to science. So this is how we went about it. From Islamic, we moved to local herbs, we moved to Eastern herbs, we moved to Western herbs, and so here we are. Okay, now a lot of young people these days, when you want to start business, uh, uh, one of the main concerns is about intellectual property because you're, you're creating something and then you're putting it out there in the market and things like that. And uh, one thing about your business that interests me is actually the importance that you give to intellectual property uh, because you're involved in patent drugs, these, these natural medicines that you do. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that? Okay. The intellectual property is actually the... Um, it is the sustainability of a healthcare business. If you don't have intellectual property, then it's difficult um, for you to be having a healthy long-term business. Now, what happens with the natural products is um, you cannot patent a lot of it. You can't. Uh, you may make a finding that probably our grandmothers or great-grandmothers knew for ages, and it's a common thing, but you're adding signs to it. You can only patent the process. So that's why people hold very closely to um, intellectual uh, property in, uh, in the business. And the NKEA, 
allows us to work on that, um, not so much as a product, but more adding science to the natural product. So rather than having just taking the plant and saying, aha, I'm a farmer, you move further down the value chain and you're actually exploring into premium products, you're exploring into international business, uh, you're exploring into partly part of food security as well. Um, and uh, yes, it becomes part of a GNI generator for the government. And again, the numbers are also very important. <laughs> what are the markets that you are actually uh, going into aside from the Malaysian market? Okay, uh, we are primarily a business to business. So we, we have gone into the, um, the, what the multinationals would term as the Far East market, which is our region with our partners. And on our own, we have presence in North Africa and Middle East countries. What are the challenges that you face when it comes to, I don't know, maybe maintaining an international standard when you are in this outside market? Well, this is tough, you see, but um, you see, the international standards are far and wide. What is acceptable in Europe, at least if you speak about it 10 to 15 years ago, what was acceptable in Europe was the complete opposite of what was acceptable in the US for political and social reasons. Today, the, as the world becomes flatter, the, um, the quality guidelines, the international guidelines are becoming more and more similar. So this becomes easier. The, 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 um, the competitive advantage that Malaysia has in our industry is the halal and sharia compliance standard that uh, we are looked upon as a reference country. So we draw a lot on that, on that advantage. Okay, I, um, tell yeah, I was going to go to you, Haji Ibrahim, yes. Can I tell the audience what you are doing under APP1? Eh? APP1 is uh, things related to herbal industry. We want to make our pharmaceutical company, actually, to be a global player. They produce botan through production of botanical drugs with scientific claims. That means they have to have preclinical trial, clinical trial, so that they can have high-end products. But of course, along the line, we develop our own raw material production. All along the chain, we develop our research, all funded under NKA program. At the moment, we have uh, seven or eight companies under EPP1, which have their own products under preclinical trial. So probably that trade secret. Huh? I won't tell uh, what products you are producing. But uh, it's from our local herbals. So hopefully in a couple of years' time, we can have our Panadol from herbal products, hopefully. And then generate very high income for the country. I mean, if you look at uh, standards, as far as standards are concerned, right? I mean, in Malaysia, okay, we have uh, Shanas, you, you are penetrating the international market. What about the farming and food industry? Uh, are, there, are there plans, Mr. Louis, are there plans, you know, to go into the international market? And if, if the standard is high or achievable, or, you know? I, I think in, uh, in uh, our own context here for fresh milk, I think the opportunities for export probably, I would say, uh, not, uh, not quite there. Probably the furthest we can go is, uh, is Singapore, which is next to us. Now, uh, at the moment, as I say, uh, the industry that we're in, we, we barely can even meet what our nation's uh, requirements. So I think our focus are very much uh, domestic for now. And uh, going forward, I'm not sure, maybe in a decade or two, depends on how well the, the overall industry has been driven and, uh, and, uh, and to what size we can reach. I think most probably... Is still very much, uh, but I think I want to add uh, the our Malaysian halal actually really uh, is, is a great branding. Uh, for example, I think uh, if there is ever an opportunity for us, we would like to look at the items like cheese, you know, or butters and things like that, because uh, these are the items that I think that uh, if you if you do it down here with the halal branding and you're able to export, these are the ones that actually has got the shelf life to actually be exported elsewhere. So uh, maybe down the road, these are the aspects of business that we might want to look at, yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Wong, organic, organic food products like chicken and all that. What are your thoughts? I mean, the halal, the halal standards that we have exported overseas, uh, your thoughts? Malaysia have uh, pretty good standards for organic uh, produce, uh, in including organic uh, processing. So, so those, those standards are internationally uh, recognized, except that uh, the organic standards in Malaysia are halal compliant. You know, for example, farmers uh, like us are not allowed to use, uh, uh, what do you call this, dung from uh, waste product from pigs, for example. You know? Whereas overseas, some of the overseas standards allow that. 
so you know, so the standards are there. Um, I wanted, I, I think for new entries, young people who want to go into the food business, uh, agri-food business, we are talking about agri-food, so agri-food business, I think uh, just focus on the halal uh, industry. Forget about the rest, because the competition is, is extreme. You know, uh, uh, in the case of chickens, for example, for us, I mean, the chicken industry in Malaysia must be about 50 years old. You know, I mean, when we wanted to go into the chicken business, we find that there is already a, a, a sort of a... <laughs> I, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's a cartel, but definitely there is an old boys a network there, and it's almost impossible to get into it. Uh, in term, you see, the key to modernization and, and, and making money in, in, in uh, agriculture actually is to be able to distribute. And one of the things about the old boys network is that they control distribution. And the new player just can't hook on to it. You know? and, and, and so you just, if you can't hook on to it, why fight, uh, why bang your head on the wall? You just say, well, forget you guys, let's go into the halal business. You know, because the halal business, the halal business is cutting edge. It is today. Hypermarkets are today. Supermarkets are today. 70% of Malaysians are living in urban areas. You know, there's a huge market here. So the, the hypermarkets are opening up all over the place and the hypermarkets are linking up all the states, all the urban centers in Malaysia and overseas through their, their uh, supply chain uh, network, which is computerized, which is very efficient, which moves goods up and down overseas, you know, which you can never do on your own. So if you are going into uh, agriculture, agri-food business, just concentrate on the halal business. You know, because the, 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 the hypermarkets, supermarkets, they are already into it, and they will take your product, move it to Singapore, move it to Tokyo, move it to, to Beijing, wherever. You don't have to spend money on it. You, you, were, you mentioned to me just now earlier before, before we came in front of the audience that uh, uh, distribution is key, like, you, like, like what you mentioned yeah. just now. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit of your experience, how, how you, you know, broke into the cartel. You know, I can't. Try to... I can't. So I, I did the next best thing. I set up my own distribution network. You know, because the, the, the existing network is, an, is a network of middlemen and, uh, and the speculators. Speculators are the scum of the earth. And they are, they are found all over uh, in the financial sectors, in the food industry, in construction industries, everywhere. You know? So if you can't... Uh, fight with them. You, so what we did was that we established our own uh, distribution network. Okay. We buy our own freezer trucks. We have our own uh, distribution and all that. But that is not the solution for everybody. You know, you got to have deep pockets. You got to have uh, uh, a lot of patience and, and uh, you have to believe in God, you know, at the end of the day <laughs> to help you. Faith, Faith. right? <laughs> Haji Ibrahim, maybe you can shed some light. Uh, this barrier to entry, is the government doing anything to maybe encourage people to come in so that, you know, they don't face this kind of problem? Shall I repeat what our minister said? Jihad to middlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Jihad mean holy war. <laughs> so, at the ministry now, they are working very hard how to, if not to eliminate middlemen, but how this middlemen won't exploit the farmers uh, exorbitantly. Uh, how to control it so that it's manageable. So they have a few programs, uh, increase pasar tani, increase pasar borong. Uh, let's, uh, the association do the marketing itself, like Netmat, Persatuan Nelayan, LPP, Lembaga Pertubuhan Peladang, Farmer, let this, all these agency play more aggressive role in terms of marketing so that there'll be alternative for farmers. And so, for example, like our anchor company, we ask our anchor company, we ask our farmers, uh, which has some synergy farming with the anchor company, to do the marketing with the anchor company. So we break the cartel. One of the ways new entrants into the market, I think uh, you, you can break the, the, the middleman thing, is that you farm to a standard. Because a mealman, he doesn't understand standards, but the consumer understands standards. Okay? So, uh, 
if the consumer understands standards and your farm do a standards, and if you can communicate that direct to the consumer, the consumer will look for you. Okay? And like in our case, for example, what we did was we farmed to a standard, we communicated that standard to uh, Jaya Jusco, Jasco Jusco. Uh, we communicated that to, to some of the supermarket chains. Uh, the Japanese directors came to the farm and examined everything, and once they're happy, then we tell our, our, our potential customers, okay, we farm to this standard and it's available there. You know? And we, we bypass all the, the middlemen. And now, Jusco uh, is providing some of the logistic support. That means to say, we send our chickens to a distribution center with, that belongs to them. And then they send it to Ipoh, they send it to Penang, they send it to Johor. We don't have to do that anymore. Because the reason why farmers depend on the middleman is because the middleman provides that the distribution and all that. So once again, we go back to the distribution thing, you see, because the farmer can't afford to have all the trucks and everything. So if you farm to a standard, communicate that to your, your consumer, uh, communicate that to hypermarkets and supermarkets, because they, they are the, 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 I mean, most of the, I think about 60% of Malaysian consumers now shop in these places and not in the wet market anymore. You know, so it's there. You, 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 if you do that, uh, number one is to, I think firstly, uh, most importantly, is that you farm to a standard. And the second thing, new entrance into the market, what you must do is that, uh, don't go for generic, uh, go for niche marketing. You know? Again, the middlemen don't understand niche marketing. You know? Middlemen don't understand standards, they don't understand niche marketing. So if you, if you, if you uh, farm to a, an aim for a particular niche, you, you don't have to worry about them. You can break the cartel. This is our jihad. <laughs> so, so niche, as you're talking about, uh, maybe you can give a little bit more example about niche marketing. I mean, you, you, you mentioned halal. What about, you know, any other niche? Um, when we first started, for example, uh, I mean, ayam is ayam, you know. Even though you call it ayam, I mean, one is broiler, one is ayam, kampung that's it, you know. So what we did was, we, we looked into it, we studied into it, we decided that there is a, uh, a segment of the market that's, that is willing to pay a little bit more, a premium price, if you can prove to them that the chickens that you produce fulfill certain uh, health, requir health requirements that they have. So there is one, number one, there is an existing need. Number two, if they, the consumer do not know about omega-6 and omega-3 and the effects on their health long term, we educate them. So we create a need. So you have an existing need, you have a, uh, uh, we create a need, and then we fulfill that need. So, uh, uh, in, in our case, that's what we did. We, we created a need uh, and we create a niche. And so far, I think for the past 10, 15 years, we have had no competitors. There's nobody else who can catch up with us. Okay. Now, speaking of st standards, <laughs> speaking of standards, who monitors the standard? Is it uh, monitored by uh, in internally by the industry itself, or does the government play a role? How does it work? How do you mean? Yeah, thank you. I was about to touch that also. I was about to ask Mr. Wong, is he using our standard or his own standard? Um, when it comes to uh, fruits and vegetables, of course, it is ministry standards. Chicken is slightly different because Malaysia don't have a standard for chicken. So we have our own standard based on international standards. But how do we back it up? It is not Mr. Wong talking, you know. We, every uh, two or three months, we will send for independent lab and get the results, and it's all available for consumer. Any consumer, it is, when you talk about my chicken is like this, you must have something to back you up, you know? And, and what we do is that we have our uh, lab results and our lab tests that are available for people to see and examine. Yeah, as far as the ministry is concerned, we have just rebranding our standard through a Pemandu initiative also. We call our standard now My Gap. Not like before, Pertanian, they have their splum, aquaculture, they have salam, and then uh, veterinary service, they have their salt. So now we rebranding it, we call it My Gap. That means uh, for all those sectors, aquaculture, uh, under fisheries, agriculture, under ag Department of Agriculture, veterinary services, all using My Gap. So it's easier for us to promote our standard overseas also. And of course, uh, as far as those company going under NKA, we want them to make sure also they follow all the standards because we want to tap what we call premium markets, not necessarily market overseas, but 
local market also, we want to go for premium markets. That means safety is not only meant for overseas people, but also for our people. Okay, I mean, what, what's, there is a different standard, international, domestic, or is it going to be the same? No, when, it's going to, when we say my gap, that means it's in conformity with international standard. Uh, so speaking of international standards, uh, Shanas, maybe you can share a little bit of your experience uh, in the ph pharmaceutical industry and how you, you know, the, the challenges that you face in trying to keep up to that quality, to that standard. In the pharmaceutical industry, it's actually slightly easier because Malaysia as a country is a signatory to the PICS, which is the Pharmaceutical Inspection Convention Scheme. So, under this convention scheme, our standards comply or are similar to European standards. You have most of the European countries signatory to the PICS. The Japanese are signatories to it. The US has recently signed on. So you have the major continents there. So to comply to the international standards in pharmaceuticals and healthcare is relatively easier. What becomes difficult is actually the halal standard. Okay, because the... I think Malaysia needs to look at the halal standard very carefully and we need to learn to stay ahead of the pack because today, although um, some years ago we started with Halal Development Corporation and we started the halal standards with Tun Mahathir as the chairman of OIC and what have you, today the countries that are ahead in the, that are leading the group in halal standards is not Malaysia. Thailand has progressed huge. Uh, Australia has, is the highest, is the largest exporter of halal meat. So where are we on this uh, on this scale? We want to come up with standards, but our but our products are not making it big. I don't think this is right. The equation is not exactly balanced. There. So this is a challenge to me. The quality standards, the ISO standards, the safety co efficacy standards. These are in the healthcare business pretty much um, pretty much uh, established. The thing is, as uh, Haji Ibrahim was mentioning earlier, our industry is still fragmented. We still have that traditional idea of what uh, farmers uh, of what farmers are, i.e., they're supposed to be wearing this huge straw hat with this tall boots and going into the paddy fields or farming some vegetable, uh, screaming at some cows or something like this, which is not exactly the case at all. So this is where the, uh, the, 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 the fragmented industry is. And I think um, MOA um, with Pomandu and uh, the team, they're trying to do... It's, it's amazing if you look at the big picture, at a helicopter view, what the NKEA is all about and how they're getting companies. It's, it's a government-driven but private sector-led initiative to drive the uh, national... Uh, to drive the GNI. I was about to talk on sustainability of farming. All right, okay. <laughs> because before, like Sanas mentioned, we totally depend on small farmers, you know. Our focus in Ministry of Agriculture also, we give subsidy, membaik pulih kolam terbia, you know, kolam ikan. So, so it's not private sector driven. When we have our impact project also, we develop infrastructure for the company, company will come in and then mismatch of technical facilities given. So under NKA, it's very good because we want the private sector to drive. We just facilitate. So I think with our present initiative, we can see at the moment we have 100 over anchor companies to say in all sectors, agriculture, horticulture, aquaculture, uh, and also livestock services. And uh, all these company, since they are investing, even though we give, say, maximum of 30% in terms of uh, grants, but they are investing their own money. So when they put 70% of their own money into the project, I'm sure they will make sure that by hook or by crook, the, the project will be successful because government invests only 30% of it. And our, what we do also, we do the reimbursable basis. You pay first. You, what you call it, you, you walk the talk or whatever. <laughs> you pay first with your own money, and then after that, after paying, after you finish construction or whatever, we reimburse you. Not only that, 
we retain some of the money also when they achieve their KPIs. That means when they produce, then only we give 30% of, of what we owe them. That means not only they finish construction or whatever they are supposed to do, but they have to produce outcome of what they are supposed to produce. So I think this is a very good initiative. And hopefully by 2020, uh, we can achieve progressive nation, high income nation, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Haji Ibrahim. Everybody is invited for refresh refreshments outside. I want to thank the panelists for being here and thank everybody, even the media for being here. So thank you very, very much. Yeah.